excuse me, this is your father. Not actually, this is Albert, your host of IT Visionaries. Just wanted to let you know and remind you, IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience, build connect experiences, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Of course, they are our beloved sponsor. They make IT Visionaries go. Give them a click if you're looking to do what they do best. Otherwise, back to the show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest, the president and COO of Diligent Corporation, Lisa Edwards. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Super exciting to be here. All right. Listen, when we were doing our diligence on you, we had not heard of your company. Then we looked it up. We saw there's over 1,500 people that work there. It's international. So for our audience who doesn't know what Diligent Corporation is, tell us what it is that your team does. Yeah, we are, you know, the best hidden secret, I guess. Um, We are the world's largest GRC company in the SaaS uh, uh, structure. Um, GRC stands for Governance, Risk, and Compliance. So we have a series of products that essentially help um, companies be better. So how do they govern their business, including um, their board uh, software portals and how their boards of directors interact with each other in a secure, easy way, um, their entity and subsidiary management, um, their um, audit socks, compliance, third-party risk, cyber risk, enterprise risk management, all of those things that sort of help a company manage their, their flank and uh and be better. We uh, we have twenty five thousand customers in one hundred and thirty countries around the world, and um, you know, as you said, we have about eighteen hundred employees and 1, uh, and growing. So, uh, if anyone's interested in a job, hit us up because we are uh, we're trying to bring on as many people as we can. All right, there's no question that big giant companies get held or held responsible for a lot of things. Sometimes it can feel like things can only go wrong. Um, and give us an idea of what it takes to build you know, a software to manage this, because when, when someone who's not familiar, so a lot of our listeners, of course, won't be too familiar with your industry, but when you sit back and think about all the things that a company has to be responsible for, and then of course you have to layer in software, you know, I'd love for you to explain to our audience who's not as familiar with the industry, like talked about like how this even begins to happen, because we can kind of understand through bad news alone, like one of the bad things that can happen. Um, Of course, your job is to make sure those things don't happen. So give us an idea, like how does one begin to develop a solution for this problem? Because the problem is very dynamic. It's not like, you know, you're not, it's it's just broad. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. You know, it's funny. Um, A lot of people are touched by, uh, by these functions. So I will give you an example. You know, I used to run finance operations at Salesforce and you'd think, okay, uh, what does that have to do with, you know, GRC software? Well, we had an enormous um, SOX practice. So Sarbanes-Oxley, um, you know, is the set of things that you have to uh, comply with and um, document and pull samples on and all that kind of stuff. And I managed it on the back of a spreadsheet, you know, and it was, <laughs> it was terrible. Um, and, um, you know, many, many of your, um, of, of your listeners, whether they're, you know, CIOs, CTOs in the technology business in general, you know, we used to call them uh, IT GRCs. So IT general, uh, I don't even remember what it stands for, but it basically is an automated control. So you can prove that you did something because you've gone in and you've done the hard work to write a script or, um, you know, RPA or you know, it's, it's automated. So it, you know, you know, it's right. All you have to do is test the code, not the hundred, hundred, 200, 5,000 samples uh, that they, that your auditors might ask you for. So a lot of people are touched by this. It's bringing technology to um, I think the last bastion of homegrown homemade stuff. And it's always the, it's always the back office that gets the, you know, the innovation last. This is truly the digital transformation of the back office. So when I think about the, you know, the evolution of um, enterprise software, you know, you start with ERP coming together in the eighties and nineties and into the, you know, sort of late part of the nineties where, you know, you had point technologies that 
kind of made sense to merge together. So, you know, you have the oracles and the SAPs, you know, building out these, these things that would say, well, it's not just your financials. You also have to have your inventory management and your logistics management and your T&E and your purchasing and all those things need to be melded together. And then the, the sum of the parts will be stronger uh, than any of the single parts. And then you have the same thing with my former employer with Salesforce going around and saying like, actually, if you have sales, it makes sense to, com to combine sales service, marketing, commerce. Um, and, and that is a stronger set of things because it is together and those pieces can pass through the same way. We're doing exactly the same thing in GRC. GRC is truly the third leg of the enterprise software stool. It takes together, you know, governance, risk, compliance, audit, SOX, um, you know, uh, enterprise risk management, and it puts it together in a, in a logical way so that, that across enterprise, you can share data, you can see those things. It's the, it's the dream of the CFO or the head of audit, um, or, or in some cases, the board to be able to have line of sight to all of these things. And give us an idea of how many things or like, and I don't even know if it's possible to say like things, like when we think of, when we think of products that we know, so you mentioned earlier Salesforce, like it's easy to say like, Hey, I manage, I'm looking over, you know, 10,000 leads, uh, you know, 500 accounts and 20,000 prospects to kind of give a framework when it comes to governance compliance, there's so many people involved. So like the, your user seats has to be massive, but give us an idea of like an, an installation looks like, like what, are, what is being managed in this software? Um, because, because this world that you play in is so out of the realm of, I think most people's like what they think about, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> most, yeah. I, like I'm not, I don't think there's kids in the garage right now. Like I can't wait to, you know, challenge diligent at, at GRC <laughs> level. Maybe we shouldn't tell them how this works, <laughs> but, but it's one of those things where like we met with Avalara once and they were mm -hmm. talking about, you know, how they got started in tax exempt certifications. I mean, it made total sense that you had to be from the accounting world to even know that that's a problem. Like why yeah. would anyone who's just sitting home, home be like, oh yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, you know, yes, um, sometimes we have implementations that have hundreds of users. Um, sometimes we have, you know, a board of directors uh, and the general counsel and the corporate secretary, you know, are the only ones using it and they're using a specific product. Um, I think where we have the, the most impact are those sort of cross, um, you know, cross platform uses where um, there are lots of people providing input going in and then we can actually have external auditors come in and, uh, and look at a version two, just using kind of user control things where they come in and they see and they can certify on the results and uh, do a, what auditors call assurance by looking at those, those pieces of data. So, you know, it's um, pretty broadly used and give us an idea of how do you how do you approach some of the challenges that are very you know interesting i don't know if they're unique to yours but like i i know one off the top of my head which is like if and if you're in government's compliance policy assurance is you're an international you work with international companies well different countries have different rules like they gdpr or obviously gdpr is the biggest one i think most of our audience understands gdpr is a very different rule that's in europe that doesn't exist here in the united states we're not the same it's not the same penalty level yet yeah. um so give us an idea of how how that all melts together like how do you guys how does your team go about defining how to solve this problem because sure Data in one collected in one country's got to be protected one way. Data collected in another country's got to be protected another way. It's, it seems pretty challenging. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we've all lived with the pain and suffering of data residency and you know where you need to have a data center and what items you can take in and out of country and where you, if you're on public cloud, you know where that where where that you know instance needs to live. And a lot of the um, you know a, a lot of that stuff um, is is really kind of architecture on the back end. Um, but then there is the other one that you mentioned, which is we're a global company. And so um, we have companies that use us around the world and, and, you know, SOX is not a requirement. That's a U.S. requirement. That's not right. a, a global requirement. There are flavors of many of these things. So we have done the hard work to look at the major markets and say, you know, if it's France or Germany or Nordics or Italy or Spain or South Africa or Australia or, you know, Brazil, um, they, they have their own uh, special quirks on that, that, uh, that we accommodate and we continue to build into the product as, you know, the regulatory environment changes and as, uh, you know, our footprint gets broader and broader. Um, and then there are a lot, there's plenty that is universal too. So we can build off a, off a common platform and, and then just have flavors of, uh, of what's needed by, um, by country or sometimes even by industry. What's relevant to some industries is, um, 
is, you know, not as relevant to other industries. And I'd say, you know, like one example of that is, is what we've done with ESG. So uh, environment social governance has become a big thing. We've almost mm-hmm. been, you know, calling it ESGRC, but that starts to get to be acronym, mm-hmm. uh, acronym hell. Uh, <laughs> but we, um, you know, we, we saw this coming. Um, we, uh, you know, we feel like ESG is quickly becoming very, very relevant to GRC. And what I mean by that is um, when you think about equality and, um, and your social impact and your, um, and your diversity perspective and your carbon footprint, all of those things, that's how are you governing your company? Um, mm-hmm. What are, you know, what are the existential risks that you're looking at? So that's the risks part. And then compliance. So there's broad um, belief that the SEC is going to mandate some form of climate disclosures, probably TCFD, uh, probably as early as the end of this year. Uh, and when that happens, companies will be expected to start filing um, TCFD and it will become a, a new standard and, and, and it probably won't stop there. There was just last week uh, some uh, some regulations passed in the UK around uh, climate disclosures as well. And so um, all of a sudden, that is not a nice to have. That's not a, you know, let's make sure we're trying to do the right thing and keeping our shareholders happy and keeping our employees happy by having a, a point of view on, on net zero. That is the regulatory, the SEC is asking me to file and certify that, I, my, that, what, that what I'm filing is correct. Um, and, uh, and it's a whole different ball game then, then it's, um, you know, in the same way that you treat your financial statements, you need to treat your environmental data. And so it's, it's right in our wheelhouse, but we were able to spin that up on the existing platform in only a couple of months. We've supplemented it with some, uh, you know, some pretty deep, um, experience and, um, technology on things like, um, uh, you know, specifically greenhouse gas and carbon and other emissions, but it's, it was a pretty quick spin up because we have the base platform ready to go. So one of the things that we do have some experience in this field, we had another guest on our show that was part of, uh, more DOD compliance, mm-hmm. specifically DOD compliance. And we looked, we, we, they showed us their software and we checked it out and it was pretty crazy, like just to do some of the DOD compliance. I mean, like the requirements alone for that one thing, just to work yep. for a contractor in DOD, the request was more than 60 pages. So then your answer, I don't even know how big your answer needs to be, but like the request for information was close to 60 pages and their software helped identify and almost, I wouldn't say like, it almost like helped them navigate, like customers navigate how to put this all together. Is that really like, is that like, a kind of a piece of what you guys do is like a little bit of education because I feel like most people probably don't know exactly how to answer a lot of these requirements. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, I'm familiar with the pain, um, <laughs> because, uh, we are one of the very few software companies in the world that is IL five certified. So we have gone through, uh, the brain damage of, of getting all of that done. And it is, it's hard work. Uh, it's a multi-year path. Um, you know, it's everything from, as you say, sort of what is your infrastructure and the security of that infrastructure to, um, you know, what personnel can you put on certain accounts and uh, where do those, you know, personnel need to be and, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think, uh, yes, there's always, um, but, but in answer to the actual question, there, there's always a, a little bit of education. You know, I think, um, one of the things where we where we always win is where you know the customer knows um, okay this is the point technology I'm interested in today, but um, you know the adjacencies to this uh, we're probably going to need those at some point. And when we do, is there one supplier, one partner who can uh, help us with all of those, or are we stuck in this point technology world? And so um, you know. The, um, and the nice thing is, you know, we've got all of the, you know, box checking on, we are, you know, at the top of the, of the magic quadrant and the forester wave and all that kind of stuff. So it's not a, it's a safe choice as well as a, um, you know, so it is be- both best of breed and uh, tech, tech, you know, the platform play where they can go into adjacencies, the contract's already done, 
you know, they've already got people familiar with it and, uh, and all it is is spinning up the next module and the next thing. So, um, so there's some education, certainly uh, when we're talking to new customers and then we try to, you know, bring a lot of best practices, whether that's, you know, just webinars and uh, talking to our base and bringing in experts and, um, and really sort of cross pollinating um, even amongst you know, our user base. So we've been doing some things and thinking through what is what are those communities look like and how do we help them uh, share amongst themselves? Because many cases like, you know, this, the, um, the functions aren't necessarily um, in competition, sometimes even when the companies are, you know, we yeah. all have a common, uh, a common need to have uh, physical, you know, security on our data centers. And all of us doing that well brings more trust to the entire industry. And when that happens, goodness ensues. So there's things that we can agree on, even when, you know, even in places where we might, you know, uh, you know, on a day-to-day hand, hand-to-hand combat might be competitive. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, is how did you get interested in this subject? Because compliance, <laughs> I got it. And I got to ask, because, because you kind of mentioned it loosely, but most people don't find, let's say, compliance requirements fun. You know what I mean? They didn't fire people up. Like, I can't wait to get in there and uh, make sure I'm we're hurt. compliant. I'm, I'm, you mentioned I'm, the pain. You mentioned I'm, the I'm deeply hurt. Pain. <laughs> um, no, you're right. How did, you get in, how did you get into this industry? I said we were the best kept secret. You know, when I started thinking about uh, life after Salesforce and thinking I probably have one or two more big jobs left in me um, and what are those going to be? And, um, I, you know, this will get a little touchy feely, but I, I, I really sort of felt like I wanted more impact and I wanted to that I, I wanted to leave a bigger legacy than, you know, she sold a lot of software on the internet. I think I was driven or attracted to both. Um, look, I'm like everybody else. I like to win. This company is set up awesomely. It's, it's got a broad customer base. It's deeply entrenched in, you know, not just the, uh, Fortune 1000, but the DAX, the you know the every, everywhere that you can think of where you need to be, this company is, um, and the opportunity is huge. So there was certainly that, but it was also um, you know after the events of George Floyd, uh, now two summers ago, they spun up in a very short period of time um, something around. Um, bringing equity and diversity to boards. And so one of the, the one of the many products that we have is a board portal. Uh, over 700,000 of the most powerful people in the world use this. They get onto our software, they manage their board meetings. And we said, wow, what if like we could, there's, and there's lots of diversity issue initiatives going on on boards now. There's women on boards, there's Athena Network, there's Latino corporate directors. There's a lot of good organizations doing good work. But we said, we're in a unique place. We have we have the eyeballs. They're getting on our on our platform, uh, and they're doing that at least quarterly, often much more. And so, what if we allowed them to nominate board ready individuals who ideally were you know women and people of color ready for their their role? Um, and it was sort of the the stamp of approval of someone who knows how to be a sitting board member in a publicly traded company and can say, this person's ready. Um, So we did that and we spun up this this rising director network where um, we now have a large um, group of directors that uh, we've got major search firms involved. We've got private equity firms involved. We've got you know corporates involved, uh, you know, our, and our user base involved. When they need to find a new board member, they can look on our portal and look for, um, you know, let's let's get some other people on the slate. Let's try to diversify uh, your board. And by the way, um, we also help with the education around that. So you know, it is we're, you're not just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Which by the way, it is but do it because it's good for your business. Um, There's a lot of data that shows that um, boards that are uh, more diverse and leadership teams that are more diverse uh, are more likely to have uh, outsized returns, uh, are likely to be more profitable and grow faster. And so, okay, that feels like a good thing. It feels like a win-win. So, you know, that's kind of what, um, you know, for me was, was really attractive about a company that was not just, saying the right thing and trying to do the right thing, but really in a, posi- in a unique position to be able to use the influence that it has to, uh, to help companies um, get better. And then when you look at, you know, things like, 
Um, there's such movement around this right now. There's there's debt being tied to uh, diversity inclusion stuff. Um, you look at the, there was an announcement by Carlisle around a $4 billion fund around, okay, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to provide um, funding based on whether or not the, the leadership team is diverse. And when they did this, actually, they did it with the board and they did this in 2016, they started with, you need to have one female on your board. Um, now over 90% of their boards comply with that. But the interesting thing and why they pushed it to the next level and said, okay, now it's 30% is not because like, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, it might be actually, it's definitely possible in that case that they said, this is the right thing to do. But what they found was the returns of that portfolio that had a larger percentage of women and minorities in positions of power we're actually outperforming the other ones. And so uh, it is both the right thing to do. It's you, it's doing well and doing good. No, I really like that. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I love the spirit behind those policies that you talked about and like the was plain diversity of thought, right? If everyone's an echo chamber, then of course, there's never, you're never going to create any type of innovation. Some of the things that you get to see are really unique. You talked about the diversity movement and getting more people, underrepresented people, whether it's gender, race, into positions of power that are qualified. Uh, you talked about some of the environmental initiatives, how companies are basically transforming to answer, I guess, the needs of you know society at large for the future. What are some other areas where you see some really positive impacts of, you know, some of the things you're doing, some of the things that, you know, governments are asking of their, of the, or the public is asking of corporations. You know, there's a, there, there's always been, I think like it's an us versus them, like the people versus the corporation. You'll see like people try to say companies are bad and news or whatever. Yeah. But the reality is we, we all coexist, whatever we, we all in completely dependent on each other for that matter. Tell us about some of the things you're starting to see there you could potentially see changing the way we live maybe in the next five, 10 years. You know, I think there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of change afoot and it's actually really exciting change. Um, you know, I think when uh, the World Economic Forum first came out with stakeholder capitalism, you know, probably five years ago now, uh, everyone's sort of like, okay, sure. Um, and now it's really pretty broadly, ex you know, uh, expected that there are, um, there are a variety of stakeholders. It is your employee base. It's your it's your community. It's uh, your customers. It's your and it's your your shareholders. And it's important to um, you know address all of those. And you know I think again five years ago you would not have CEOs taking a position on public items uh, that weren't directly impacting their business and. Of course, now many CEOs are expected to weigh in on uh, on a variety of things. So they, um, you know, certainly I think that that has changed. Um, there's also a ton of momentum. Um, you know, there was just the COP uh, conference in Europe last week, and um, there's a ton of momentum around climate. And um, you know, it's it's. It's not uh, an accident that many companies have pledged uh, net zero and are mm. moving forward. As I said, you know, um, there's there's broad understanding that the SEC is probably going to mandate something. Uh, when Chairman Gensler came in earlier this year as the head of the SEC, um, he uh, like like all other SEC heads publishes a. Uh, you know, a regulatory agenda. I guess it was number one on the regulatory agenda. Number one on the regulatory agenda was the financial, the impact of the financial markets of, of climate change and, uh, and human capital management. So, mm. um, you know, it says that uh, at least, you know, at least for, for public markets in the United States, you better be paying attention to your diversity and inclusion. You better be paying attention to your climate positioning and uh, whether or not you pledge net zero, whether or not you have policies around this. And, you know, there's not a bad place to get started. It's still early. And I'm sure that when those regulations come out, there will be a time frame for companies to sort of get compliant and get in line. But it's very clear that it's coming. And there's um, there's there's just a lot of momentum around it for all the right reasons. I mean, I think it is. Um, you know, we talk about uh, you know we talk about going to Mars, and that's super cool. Um, but uh, I would like to not have to go to Mars. Um, I would like to have the option to stay here uh, as well. And it feels like ultimately that's probably cheaper and easier. Um, so you know, it's uh, it's optionality. <laughs> Listen, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I believe you know. I am an environmentalist at heart. 
I like to think so, at least. When I found out that recycling act doesn't actually happen, I was devastated. I, I felt know. like I felt like I've been lied to for like the last thirty years. I'm oh, like, and I know. can't undo it either. I just get so anxious when I can't throw away my aluminum can in the in the recycling <laughs> bin. <laughs> yeah, even though I, I'm I, I'm with you, even though I know. If I throw this plastic in the plastic bin, it probably won't get recycled. I'll still do it because I'd like to think there's a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. You know, when you, when, what would you say, you know, this is a little change of subject, but you know, you're obviously in a really interesting position. The company does, I would say what your company does, the way to describe it is like, while it might, like you just described, while it might not be known to most people, it is very powerful and is actually leading source of change for company and how it, the, the organizations, corporations behave, which of course impacts all of us. In your Twitter bio, you claim that you are an operations guru. And I want to know, <laughs> what, what are some of your philosophies or what are some of the practices you've seen work extremely well building this organization up to be the leader in, in, in this industry, in the GRC industry? Like what are some of the things that you think that you guys are doing really well? And where are some opportunities you think that you guys can still, you know, move forward in or get yeah. better at? Yeah. You know um, yeah, there's not that many people who actually love operations and, uh, and I am one of the, I am one of the, the geeks that, that get super into it, but I would say, you know, I think the, the magic often of scale is, is really thinking through, um, you know, what do we need to put in place to be better, faster, stronger? Um, and it's uh, it's always tricky, right? So you're in a hyper growth environment, um, and I and I lived this life at Salesforce too. Um, you know, nobody likes process. So what is the mm. right <laughs> level of right? No, none of us do. What is the right <laughs> level of process that will get you? you know, repeatable actions, um, you know, the same person that says, I, I hate process will say, why can't you capture all these answers from RFPs and create a library and just crank <laughs> it out when I, when I push a button? Like, okay, yeah, we can do that, but it starts with like capturing. Um, so I think if you show people the value of, um, of doing the sort of infrastructural foundational work, um, and, uh, you know, then, then it pays off in spades. And so it, it, it's, you know, I, I probably, uh, you know, I probably need to change my Twitter bio because I also really care about the top line. I really care about growth and I would never let process get in the way of growth, but I recognize that unless you have some process at some point you will break things and you will not be able to grow. And the reason that's so relevant to sort of this risk and compliance world is that's who lives it in spades. When uh, when you do not have the right controls in place, when you don't have the right um, policies and procedures and all that kind of stuff, and you're not capturing that data and testing it and looking at it and saying, do we have fraud? Like, uh, why'd this happen? Um, you know, that's when you can get in trouble. And that that is an existential risk. That is not a um, you know, oopsie daisy. Um, so, um, guarding against those existential risks while allowing the company to run as fast as it possibly can is sort of the way that I like to think about it. And, um, you know, I do think that, you know, some of the things that, that we think about as a product, it's why it, why it's why it makes it me happy because, um, honestly, like risk and compliance and audit, except if you're a risk compliance officer, <laughs> It's a pain sometimes as a, as a person in, you know, as a lay person in the company um, saying, you know, having the auditors come and say, have you filed your SOC stuff yet? Um, <laughs> here's, here's 60 contracts that I need you to pull to prove that, that, uh, you know, they, they, they follow the policy. Um, well, what if we automate all that? Like, what if it's just, it's, it, it's scripts and it's, um, it's digging down into the right systems and we can automate that for your SOX items. We can automate that to pull out of your, uh, out of your, you know, um, people soft or work day to say, let's look at your, your diversity is, uh, are your hires, um, you know, getting, getting more equal or less equal? Are your attrits getting more equal or less equal? And how is that netting out, uh, as you look at diversity of, uh, of your company, how does that look uh, overall at your company versus how does that look uh, for your leadership team or your managers and above? And then how is that changing over time? And why is that important? Um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you, if you can automate it and you can, you can put sunlight on it, um, 
you know, I think most people objectively feel like, okay, it's probably a good thing to, you know, be more equitable, be more sustainable, but if they can't see it, they can't manage it. And what, um, and, and so what we try to do is make it so it's easy to see and easy to manage. No, that's awesome. And while you were talking about that in regards to like the, the two different types of people, right? The people that say, hey, the, 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 that's not the same two different types of people. It's the same person who says two different things. Yeah. Uh, you, your example was, Hey, I'm not a process person at the same time. How come I don't have X, Y, and Z from this data? Uh, and you would say, cause you don't have a process to collect it. I'm with you 100%. I do have to ask you a question now. This is just more a personal question. I'm just, uh, regarding your management style. I'm curious, do you like things done, um, based upon like, Hey, everyone needs to do things this way. And if, 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 and then, or do you like making exceptions to the process for, for like each group says, I need an exception because <laughs> this is, you're smiling because I have a feeling you're going to say both. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, there are technology people in this podcast, right? Yeah. They're, okay. Okay. So they know uh, that the business is always going to ask for like, I am a snowflake and I got to have these 17 custom things. And I know that like this company has spent, you know, 10 years building this thing to, to be, uh, you know, best practices. But like, what I really need is this other thing. And sometimes uh, those things are corrected. You have to build around it and sometimes they're not. So I would say, um, you know, ideally there's a, a right way to do things. Um, and we've built out, I feel like enough in product around, you know, different lanes, uh, for different industries and sort of templated configurable approaches that allow people to take it and make it what they need it to be without going so far off the range that, um, you know, it doesn't, um, uh, it, you know, it doesn't make sense anymore. It's not easy to upgrade. It's not easy to use all that kind of stuff. So it's that sort of fine line. I remember when I was at, when I was at Visa a thousand years ago, um, the CFO had this thing, like we were putting in, I can't remember what it was like a new ERP module or something like that. And it was okay. Every customization has to come to me personally for sign off. And, <laughs> and as the, as the person trying to get it in place, it was incredibly useful actually to have that backstop there. Cause nobody wanted to go talk to him. Nobody wanted to go try to explain like, okay, here's my special snowflake and why. I have to have to have it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I'm with you. You and I are aligned on that. Now I've granted, I've never built a company the size of yours, but and the companies I've been a part of, we got into a couple hundred people. I always say, I don't want to manage the exceptions. Right. Like we, we're going to, sure. we're going to try to make the exceptions look more like everybody else. Yep. And uh, that was a way that I thought got us scaling faster. Lisa, it was awesome having you on the show and Thank you for sharing so much about Diligent. But before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Lisa, this is where we ask you questions outside of the world of work so our audience can get to know you a little better. You ready? I am ready. All right. Right out the gate. It also says on Twitter, you are a mom. And we checked you out on LinkedIn. You're a member of YMCA and Playworks. These are all really cool things. Tell us about Playwork specifically and why I'm so, like, what, what is it about those organizations that gets you so, I guess, motivated to be, to be part of it? Yeah. You know, I was on the board of both Playworks and um, what the Presidio YMCA for a long time. I really believe in the mission. Um, both of them really are around kids. Um, so Playworks uh, is a super cool nonprofit based in the East Bay, California here uh, that um, it, the, their motto is we believe in the power of play to bring out the best in every kid. So they go into particularly underprivileged schools and yeah. they, uh, they help structure recess, create opportunities for leadership, um, create a safe environment for kids. And the Presidio YMCA is very similar. One of the most beautiful places in the entire world, uh, the Presidio in San Francisco and the sister property across the Golden Gate Bridge. And same thing, they're bringing opportunities to, you know, sometimes they bring in buses to kids that have literally lived in San Francisco their entire life and have never seen the beach. I mean, just wow. shocking uh, and just really doing good work. So um, I, I continue to be super supportive of both those organizations. They're both fantastic organizations. Listen, I'm with you. I have a parent of three. And I always think to myself, like when people talk about like cutting things in school and they want to cut recess, I'm like, no, kids need to play. It is more important for them to play than it is for them to color or whatever. I mean, not that coloring is wrong, but they just yeah. need to play. <laughs> All right. We looked you up, you know, we mentioned before we checked you on LinkedIn and we saw that you've educated two of the premier universities in the world, Harvard and Stanford. Which one do you like more? 
Do you feel ooh, allegiance to? Ooh, <laughs> can I say that on a podcast? Yeah, we, you, think, you would lean towards somebody. I know that. <laughs> you know, I would say for pure joy, uh, Stanford probably wins, but it was also that epic of my life, right? I was an undergrad at Stanford and in business school at Harvard. I loved them both and made lifelong friends in both. Um, but, you know, probably the the happiest period of just pure unadulterated joy in my life was uh, those, those four years at Stanford. That's awesome. What do you do today for fun when you're not at work and you get a chance to yourself, what do you choose to do? You know, I do a lot of hiking. I really love uh, being outdoors and, you know, like all of us, I, I've locked inside on 10 or 12 hours of zoom a day. So <laughs> yep. when I get the opportunity, I take my dog, I have uh, two dogs. I have a, a rescue mutt named Ellie and a, and a princess purebred lab named Kiki. And uh, the three of us go on walk about, you know, into the trails. Oh, I love it. And you had mentioned before you care about the environment. You're a hiking person. So I got to ask, what's one of the most beautiful natural landscapes you've ever get, gotten a chance to witness? Oh, so many. Um, I just, I really love Northern California, to be honest with you. There's a great hike that starts at, uh, over kind of on the edge of Mount Tam and dips down into Stinson Beach through, uh, through the Dipsy Trail, they call it. It's a, there's a major race that's run there. And then it goes up through a completely different landscape. Um, like you really see the microclimates because you're going from these beautiful hills and rolling plains kind of thing. And then you, on the way up, you go up this thing called Steep Ravine and there's there's ferns and redwoods and it's almost raining and there's water everywhere. It's the craziest thing. So that's probably my favorite hike in the world. Now, that sounds pretty cool. Do you have to be, uh, you have to be pretty in shape? It sounds like to do that one. That particular one is about three and a half hours round trip. So, you know, you might want to train a little bit for it. You could probably make it, but it, it, you might not have as much fun. Hey, listen, the only time I get scared is when I have to ascend something. That's like a personal fear of mine. If I just send like some steep rocks, I don't want Well, uh, that might not be the trail for you then, because there <laughs> is actually a portion that has a ladder. Uh, so it's hard to bring your dogs on it because you have to figure out how to like, you know, my 80 pound <laughs> munchkin trying to get her pushed up the top of the ladder is, is not amongst the things that I would recommend. Yeah, listen. I appreciate that tip. I think I can deal with the latter. I always joke with our guests on the show. Like there's two things that I'm like really afraid of and they're both involved rocks. So I don't ever want to really climb rocks. Like I don't want to do it. And then caves. I don't go into caves. No. <laughs> yeah. I don't like, go into caves either. <laughs> <laughs> there's stuff in there there's yeah people movie. like yeah whenever uh that new movie the rescue came out which is about the rescue for the that thai soccer team that didn't we, go yeah mm -hmm. yeah i, I would be like if i was on that team i wouldn't have been in the cave i would have quit the team i would just be <laughs> i mean <laughs> I was like, I was i've no seen way the cartoons there. <laughs> there's definitely like a scary monster in there yeah exactly well lisa it was awesome having you on the show thanks for sharing a little bit about your life outside of work and of course sharing what you're up to at diligent like i said you like you mentioned it, it is a hidden secret if you're not at teams, people, audience, if you've not heard of this company and you're looking for a fast growth, fast paced company, Lisa's already said it. Hey, she's looking for people, 1800 plus employees, leader in the magic quadrant and GRC. What's it stand for again, Lisa? Governance, risk and compliance. Governance, risk and compliance. Listen, she's sexiest she, uh, software out there. Listen, the way you talk about it seems a lot more exciting <laughs> than, than the way I remembered it, because you know what though? I remember it as that guy because I was, I think I was like you. I was managing things in spreadsheets and it was just a link legend to all these yep. different documents and Nightmare. Dropbox and stuff. That's what I was managing. <laughs> I hear you. We're going to make it better for you. Thanks for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Mm -hmm.